All right, you think. <laughs> uh, so anyway, this is Hikari, if you don't know him. N not only does he have like the swankest, spikiest hair you've ever seen, but he's also damn smart. How's that for an introduction? Sounds good. <laughs> Hey everybody, um, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, so my real name is David Holton. Uh, some people here like to call me Akari. I'm a, uh, the chairman for Touricon and I also do lots of security R&D with FPGAs and stuff. Um, so I've already talked about some of the things I'm gonna be covering today. There's actually a lot of things here and I'm gonna skim through as much as I can. Um, first of all, have, how many people here have seen me talk before? Anybody? Okay, a few people. Um, how many people here know what FPGAs are? Yep. Sweet, okay. So I'm just gonna skim through all this stuff. As you can see, there's a lot of new uh, things I'm gonna be demoing. And uh, I'll probably skim through a lot of the explanations just so I can get to the demos. So first of all, FPGAs are a bunch of different gates that you can just hook together however you want. It's actually a chip, and uh, you can design any sort of chip design, upload it to the chip, and it'll function like that chip. So you can design your own processor, you can design your own graphics accelerator. In my case, I'm designing uh, basically a chip that cracks crypto and uploading it to these chips that we have and uh, cracking crypto with them. And when you have dedicated hardware like that, you can do things a lot faster. So this is kind of what a chip looks like. This is a Vertex 4 LX25. And it has different things like input-output pins, uh, slices, which are general purpose sort of areas of the chip that you can configure however you like. There's DCMs, which are uh, clock multipliers, let you uh, change clock frequencies and stuff. Kind of like the jumpers on the old school motherboards to set your, set your speed. Um, block RAMs, which are kind of like cache, they're storage elements inside the chip. There's uh, these DSP slices that are used for doing multiplies and additions and really high speed uh, sort of math calculations. And then all the different sort of components in here, you can connect together with the programmable routing matrix, which lets you connect anything with anything else on the whole chip, which is really what makes the whole thing work properly. So first of all, I'm gonna be covering uh, this program called Airbase. Has anybody heard of that, Airbase? Yeah, uh, okay, a couple people. So uh, Airbase is actually written by Johnny Cash, and it's a re-implementation of Aircrack and uh, also like a brute force web cracker that actually supports some um, distributed network cracking, kind of like distributed.net, where you basically have a server and a bunch of clients out there and you can feed out jobs to crack, uh, crack web by brute force. So um, <coughs> it also contains a bunch of different tools that are necessary for manipulating uh, web file captures and stuff. So you can check all this stuff out by yourself. Um, but essentially, it's all the same tools that you see with Aircrack and with any sort of standard web cracker. This is what JC Aircrack looks like. It has lots of cool ASCII effects and stuff. Um, this is JC Webcrack. It, uh, there's a daemon and the client. And we also, we also have a Pico client, which is our FPGA accelerated client. And this is kind of what, what a screenshot looks like. I'll be doing a real demo of this later. And yeah, basically, the daemon has clients that connect to it. Uh, with our Pico client, we just attach an FPGA to it and offload the web cracking to one of our cards. And uh, there's lots of different ways that you can do this. Uh, with JC Aircrack, um, one thing that Johnny actually did was he has this library that does all the RC4 cracking stuff, and he actually implemented uh, Pico support into it. And so as long as you use this library, it'll just automatically use the Pico card and um, or automatically use you know what machines you have and stuff. Oh, Pico card is one of our FPGA cards that, that we design. Um, but you can take any sort of FPGA development board, if you like, and, and use that. Um, here's actually one of them I can show you. Uh, Verilog? Yeah. So this is, our, this is our Express card. It's a Module 34 size Express card that's uh, plugged into this laptop over here. We've also got a Compact Flash one and a Cardbus one. Um, but uh, so, so basically, Airware is made so you can, you know, just uh, plug in arbitrary hardware, accelerate your algorithms, and, and just use it and not have to worry about, you know, the actual thing that's doing the computation. And actually, uh, Johnny uh, was saying that HDM threw together some RC4 acceleration for the PS3, so it actually uses the, the um, you know, hardware units on there to, doing, to do stuff. And I'll, I'll show you some performance numbers on that later. 
So this is kind of the whole tool suite. Um, you can look at it more later if you like. Uh, web cracking basics. All you do is you sniff a packet. Uh, the first few bytes are predictable, so you XOR that to get the actual output of RC4 for a given key. And then uh, from there, it's basically just taking the output of RC4 and reversing it back into the key. So my design actually uses uh, either 32 or 48 custom RC4 cores. And so I have a ton of little RC4 cores running on the chip, and they just do RC4 really fast and try to reverse that back. So essentially, your input is this K over here in RC4. I don't know if you can see my pointer. And then the output is a PRGA, and so it's just reversing that, that back across. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a total brute force attack uh, for this implementation. And then also JC Aircrack does the FMS attack for doing the statistical sort of stuff. And yeah, essentially, we have a key generator where you tell it, OK, start at this key and end at this key. It starts sending out keys to the RC4 cores, gets the PRGA back from them, and then checks to see if it's the right value or not. And so it gets a bunch of PRGA back. And then eventually, it actually finds a matching PRGA and says, OK, here's the actual key that corresponds to that. So it's fairly straightforward. <coughs> uh, one small optimization that I do is in RC4, there's this whole initialization phase that takes a really long time. And uh, that can actually d be done in parallel with all the other operations. So that's one, one optimization. You can look at the code later if you want to see exactly how all that works. Uh, then performance numbers with this is with JC WebCrack and typically like just running RC4 on a machine, you can get maybe about 300,000 uh, crypts per second. With the PS3 client that HDM threw together, uh, using all the uh, all the six SPUs, you can get about 1.4 million per second. And uh, with our little compact flash card, you can get about 12 million per second. And we also sell clusters of them with like 15 that'll get you about 180 million. And how this how this, you know relates to actually cracking a 40-bit key is that on a PC, it takes you about 42 days. With one of our cards and a laptop, you can do it in about uh, 24 hours, so a little over a day. And, um, and then if you have a cluster or multiple ones, you know, that brings the time down quite a bit. And with the, oh, with the PS3, it takes about 8.8 .8 days to break 40-bit. That's 100%, the full 40 bits. So yeah, like if you're talking about like birthday paradox sort of stuff, then it'd be maybe about half that. So Pico WebCrack uh, is basically the JC WebCrack D plus Pico cards and uh, some cool matrix effects I'll be demoing in a little bit. And uh, also a new release that Johnny just threw together is uh, JC AirCrack with uh, Pico support. So I'll be demoing that as well. See if this switches over. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All this stuff you can download off of OpenCiphers.org, by the way. Um, so this is the the wet brute force. Um, I just threw together some scripts here, typing with one hand. Yeah. This is a pretty small key, so. It'll take, won't take too long here. So this is actually starting up the daemon right now. And then it'll start up some Pico clients. Um, because this actually has three separate cores that it's talking to that each have 16 RC4 cores, um, there is basically three different instances running here. And it actually just found the key on one of them, which is a pretty simple key. But that's going at about uh, 9 to 12 million crypts per second right there, and it, it just found it. I don't have too much time, so I did a pretty short demo for this one. Um, and now I'm going to show you the air crack stuff real quick. So, uh. so here is, um, I'll show, show it to you without the FPGA support. So this is running, um, this is using the FMI, oh, can you see everything? I lose video? Or oh, there we go. OK. So right now it's doing the FMS attack with just JC Aircrack. And it's chugging along. This will probably take a little while. So as you can see, it's doing maybe about one chunk per second, maybe a couple chunks per second. 
and I'll just cancel it now because I know it's going to take a while here. Um, and so now with the FPGA, uh, now it's doing about how many chunks per second? Maybe 30 or 50 or something? Or yeah, so it's already gone through, oh, 733 chunks, and the last time it took maybe about 10 or 15 seconds to go through, <laughs> like, you know, 50 or 60. And there's some cool animations, too, so. <laughs> okay, there we go. So, see, so yeah, it's basically just like air crack, but now you can accelerate uh, brute forcing the last bytes with an FPGA. So, let's switch back over. Uh, now I'm going to switch over to this other laptop because all my other demos are going to be done in Windows. Some new support I threw together. Hopefully this Vista laptop will work. <laughs> it actually helps my demos look a little bit better because it's so slow that all the software runs slower. Uh, let's see here. displays. Ah, there we go. Okay. Hopefully my slides will work here. Ah. Start. Try restarting this. Oh, it doesn't have a stupid thing. Ah, yeah. Okay. There we go. Cool. Okay. So um, I'm going to skim through the WPA stuff. Uh, essentially, for edit security with WPA, um, when you actually type in your passphrase in Windows to log in you know, to your WPA access point, it actually hashes it with PBKDF2. And um, then it actually uses that as your key for authenticating on the network. And uh, the reason for doing this is because they just wanted to have a really good uh, secure transform from your password into an actual you know, secure key. And uh, PBKDF2 essentially just makes, is a, it runs SHA-1 about 4,000 times, and so it takes a really long amount of time to actually compute this, uh, this PMK value from your passphrase. And so their hope was that because it takes so long to do that, every time you, you know, try to convert over a real passphrase to a PMK value, it takes forever, and so somebody attacking it you know, would take a really long time to actually crack it. So essentially, uh, all I do is I just accelerate the PB, PBKDF2 phase using eight SHA-1 cores, and, um, and essentially this is the, the performance comparison that I get. Um, with Cowpatty on like uh, pretty top of the end, P4 until Core Duo, you get about 60 or 70 per second. On one of our FPGAs, like our Compact Flash one, you get about 430 per second. And with Aircrack, you get some optimizations, maybe around 100 per second on a PC. So it's maybe about uh, like six, four to six times faster than a PC, roughly. And uh, one thing that we did last year was we took a huge word list and um, kind of created a rainbow table. It's salted by the SSID, but we took the top million words in the top thousand SSIDs and created this huge table, thanks to Rendermand. And uh, finally, we have this 40 gig, uh, you know, whole thing of of uh, pre-computed values up, and the Shmoo should have it up. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So talk to Renderman if you want to get the 40 gigs, or you can grab them off a BitTorrent thanks to the Shmoo Group. And uh, I don't think that there's actually they're actually posted on their page right now, but if you do a torrent search, you should be able to find them according to Holt. So here's a demo of of Cowpatty with FPGA support and some Perl scripts to glue it together. Oh no, did I lose my screen? Oh wait, there we go. Okay, sweet. <laughs> oh no. 
Okay. Oh, uh, uh, here we go. Okay. Resize some of these. So all this stuff runs under Windows now. If you want to actually run Cowpatty under Windows, you can grab these binaries if you want. Uh, and this actually works with both of our cards, with uh, like our E12 or E16 or whatever. Um, oh man. Here, I'm just gonna. I'll show you it without FPGA support here. So that's kind of the usage for just running it normally. Right now it's chugging away really slow here. And so actually, I'll go over here and do it at the same time with one of the Pico cards here. Uh, I've got this handy batch script here. So that's it running on the FPGA on the right and uh, running on my computer on the left. And this is actually an Intel Core 2 Duo, like about two gigahertz or so. So it already found it and went through 4,000 keys and this one's still on you know, 1,800 or so. So it's obviously a little bit faster. Um, <coughs> oh, yeah. There we go. Okay. Now, how are we doing on time here? Five minutes till Q&A. Okay. Uh, next thing I'm going to talk about is File Vault. Uh, how many people here use File Vault on Mac OS X? Yeah. Yeah, a few people. Okay. So Apple has this cool explanation of File Vault. Uh, secures all your data by encrypting it with 128-bit encryption. Um, this high-performance algorithm automatically encrypts and decrypts in real time, so you don't even know what's happening. The only problem is that we wanted to know what was happening. So uh, essentially, it takes your home directory, stores it in a DMG file, and they use, uh, they basically embed the crypto stuff into the drivers, and so it automatically mounts it and does all the encryption and decryption on the fly um, from this DMG image. And there's a couple different versions of it. Uh, you can read the source, and I think that we've got some more presentations that go in more depth, but um, do some research if you want to learn more about it. Um, <coughs> so the cool thing is that it actually uses PBKDF2 for the password hashing. So it was really simple to port over my WPA stuff. I was actually at the CCC and managed to get everything ported over in like about 24 hours from the time that somebody told me that it used PBKDF2. We presented on it the next day. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty simple. It just uses 1,000 thou iterations instead of 4,000. And I worked with uh, Jacob Applebaum and Ralph Fo Philip Weinman on doing all this stuff. So yeah, um, they ended up throwing together this program called uh, VF Decrypt. Uh, we called it Vial Fault because we didn't want to have any sort of copyright problems with Apple. So I'm, I hope that they appreciate that we you know, took that into account. Um, they, they actually didn't want to write a file vault cracker, so they wrote this program that just decrypts file vault images that are encrypted. Um, and so as long as you have the right passphrase, you can feed it into this program and it spits out a clean DMG with no encryption. Um, but how do you find out the passphrase, right? So I just modified their source and hooked it up to one of our Pico cards, and so this thing will actually take a word list, you know, run it through and find the right passphrase for, for your uh, file vault image. <coughs> And uh, some other attacks that we figured out is they actually uh, don't specify that the memory shouldn't be swapped out to disk. And so if you can somehow use up a bunch of memory in the person's PC, they should swap it out to disk and you can read it from there. Um, there's also hibernation problems. A hibernation file uh, will contain you know, uh, their passphrase and, um, and their key and stuff. And uh, possibly with ring zero code, you might be able to read it. Um, the weakest link, though, uh, it turns out the RSA key that they use for the version 2 header actually has, um, is uh, easier to crack than the 128-bit key. Um, and also the Salted SHA-1 password that you use for your login uh, has a, is the same password that they use for the file vault image. So you probably want to just fire up um, their password file in John the Ripper if you have access to that because then you can use the same password for decrypting their image. So here's some performance comparisons. It's pretty similar to attacking WPA. Um, top of line machine will get about 180 to 200 per second. On uh, one of our FPGAs, it's about you know 2,000 per second or so. So here's the demo. Let's see if I can get this right. Okay. And and this you can also run without an FPGA if you like. Um, oh yeah, here. So I've got this this batch script here. 
you just give it a dictionary file in the DMG image. And um, so this is it running without an FPGA. Uh, and this is it running with FPGA in my laptop. So there, it found the passphrase. Uh, cancel that. OK. Now, um, the last thing I'm going to talk about is Bluetooth pin cracking. Um, there have been a couple other people that have done stuff like this. Uh, there's these people that wrote a paper on it that you can download off the internet, just Google for it. And also, um, another person, uh, Theory Zoller, wrote his own implementation of this. So uh, you can use mine or you can use a bunch of other implementations. Essentially, Bluetooth uses uh, the Safer Plus algorithm and uses it uh, for pretty much all the things they do. And so, um, this is basically the exchange. It's very similar to WPA in that you know you have a bunch of data that goes across the internet to exchange keys and verify that everybody has the right key. But um, the only thing that you don't really have is a pin. And because the pins are actually just you know numerical digits most of the time, uh, it's a really small amount of key space that you have to search. Uh, the maximum is basically 10 to the 16, which is still fairly small. And um, most people don't actually use the characters and most people will use like either four digits or eight digits or something like that. So <coughs> um, I basically implemented Safer Plus and then wrapped around the stuff around that to implement their other specific algorithms that are used for the key exchange. And uh, this is essentially the pseudocode for doing the whole thing. You can look at it more later. But, uh <laughs> but here's all the values and we're just brute forcing the pin here. Is that for me? No. Oh, okay, all right. So, so essentially, I just use one one safer algorithm here, and then I just loop the back the, out, the output into the input, and start swapping out these different algorithms, and uh, just basically muxing the whole algorithm. And uh, the pin generator is done on the FPGA, so it keeps it really fast. And once it actually finds a pin, it just uh, says, "Okay, this pin matches," so it backs it up and figures out, "Okay, that's that's the correct pin for the whole thing." Um, this is actually super fast. On a normal PC, it takes about it does about 40,000 per second, which means for a digi four-digit pin, it's about a fourth of a second. Um, it takes about 42 minutes for an eight-digit pin. On uh, one of our cards, we can do about 10 to 15 million per second, which is you know a few hundred times faster. And uh, an eight-digit pin only takes about 10 seconds. And I'll I'll show you this in a minute. Um, after this, I'll pretty much be done. I'm gonna get uncomfortably close to you until you stop. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> There's also a bug that's up here. Oh, sweet. Is that a prize? For oh, no, somebody asked a good question. <laughs> okay, so this is this is cracking um, one of these capture files that I have on my PC here, and um, and so this is actually this script is supposed to go through six different captures that I have with uh, some that are like five or six digits long, um, some that are eight digits long, and so this is it running on on the FPGA. Uh, wait. Huh. Why isn't it working? Ah. <laughs> I don't want to go to the next step. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. <laughs> ah. Okay, let me let me pop the sound pop back in. Let's see if that works. Okay, there we go. The first one it cracked in a split second. This next one is an eight-digit one that it cracked in a split second. And there we go. It cracked all six of these in about a total of five seconds. And the other one, it'll probably take about a few hours. So um, there you go. And uh, I'm just going to skim through here real quick. What? No. No? Okay. <laughs> wait, wait. Going to the conclusions here. There we go. <laughs> okay, questions? <laughs> You ready? Okay, so our compact flash ones, uh, we we just came out with our newer express card ones. So the compact flash ones were discounting to um, around $2,000. Uh, if you want, um, we're doing a show special for about $1,900. For uh, or wait, no, $1,800. And then for our express card one, it's going to be around 19 to 2,000 or something like that. So, uh, uh, 
Uh, manufacturers of ICs. You're modeling an IC with your FPGA. That's what you're converting into. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you can find enough people that want them, you know, we could probably do that. Yeah, but you wouldn't be able to swap around, you know, what programs you're using with it. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> Yay, let's hear it for Hikari. Yay! So he is about the most understated individual I think I know that gives these kind of talks. Because he'll be up here and be like, you know, this is kind of cool. And boom! Here's this thing that's 100 times faster. You're like, is that really? Oh my god, it is 100 times. No one else is kind of reacting though, so I'll just sit here and watch him quietly. It's like, my lord. I've been in a couple of conferences where, you know, we did that GSM talk.